uh, to this year's uh, World War II presentation of the topic being Hitler's speeches. I'm Joe Klebicek, and I'm Rachel Berry. We'll be co-presenting this evening. I'll uh, introduce uh, my part and talk about it for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Rachel will do the second part. And then uh, the last part of the evening, we'll open it up to question and answer. The packet that you have follows along roughly our presentation tonight. Uh, note that the very last page, which can be torn off, is like a feedback page. And it's optional if you want to give us some feedback. Just you know, uh, give it uh, to one of us at the end. Or uh, the, the students that are hanging out on the sides here, these They're are waving their hand. Yeah, the these folks here, over there, and over here. These are the World War II students. They they provided the legwork uh, for much of this evening. <coughs> I want to thank all of you for attending. Uh, the Rainy River Community College Foundation uh, gave us a grant for, uh, <laughs> for about, to pay for the evening for marketing and for the snacks and all the, all the things that went into this evening. So I want to thank uh, the foundation for doing that. Um, also, the students in my World War II class, um, I've been talking about this uh, evening since January, uh, and so they helped uh, make it all happen uh, tonight. Um, also, all the employees here at the college, um, I could thank several, uh, many people. Um, I, I don't know if I could have, we could have pulled this off without Diane Radboy's help for buying things. Um, and, uh, and helping uh, make all that happen, and just everybody helped out. Uh, Rachel's been an unbelievable help uh, for me. Um, so um, the, the story I tell is every time I talk to Rachel, I, I feel less smart. Um, she's very sharp. <laughs> oh, that's setting the bar really high. <laughs> that's true, though. So thank you all for attending tonight. Uh, the background and the structure of the event uh, each uh, student in my World War II class, uh, we started the, the semester with 30 students. I sent them all well, probably in February, and I had them interview two students each about the topic, and uh, they collected information, um, probably from many of you here, uh, about what you wanted to, us to talk about this evening. Now, we'll try to address uh, as many of those uh, questions as possible. We won't be able to address all of them, and so if we... Uh, if you have a question, you'll make sure you, you ask um, in the last half an hour, and, um, and we'll try to answer it for you. And if you have a question that we don't get to by the end of the night, um, our contact information is on the front page of your little uh, handout. So please do not hesitate to email us, um, call us with your questions, and we'd be grateful for that. Yep. If in doubt, just call the college at 285-7722 and ask for Rachel or Joel. We're the only Rachels or Joel, I think. Sure. This year. So you can get, get to us that way as well. All right? I'll provide an overview and then um, at roughly 7 o'clock, Rachel will dig into the speech specific items. All right? Um, regarding uh, how World War II went in Europe, uh, September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland, and pretty much a two-week campaign. Uh, the Poles, uh, they, uh, many of their uh, military folks were on horseback compared to the mechanized German uh, military, so they, they still had virtually no chance. France uh, surrendered in June of 1940, second major uh, victory for the Germans. I picked this image here. Um, it, it has been abused by the History Channel uh, and other channels. Um, uh, Hitler does a little dance, uh, kind of, a, kind of a, a step more than a dance, and uh, when France surrenders. But I've seen this image uh, uh, when, <coughs> and many, and many, uh, when many countries uh, surrendered. Uh, he's doing the same dance, um, and he only did it when France surrendered. Okay? Uh, just to let you know a little bit about uh, what it meant to Hitler, he was only there for a short time. Uh, he did, and perhaps uh, for those of you who are World War II buffs, know that he had uh, the wall removed from the museum that had the train car that the Germans were forced to surrender in in World War I, at the end of World War I. He brought the same train car out, except this time it was the French who had to surrender. So uh, in many ways, the defeat of France for Hitler was pure revenge. Okay? Perhaps nothing more. One piece that does stand out is he was so obsessed uh, with Napoleon Bonaparte, he went to his tomb and he 
looked at it and was in its presence for many hours. And then later, uh, in 1941, he attacks the Soviet Union on the same month and day, just a different year, as what Napoleon did uh, in the early 1800s. Uh, September 1940 to May of 1941, we have the Blitz. Uh, Britain is attacked uh, primarily by, well, all by air, uh, by the German Air Force. Um, Hitler's speaking uh, equal was this guy, uh, Winston Churchill, the appointed Prime Minister of Great Britain. Um, history, uh, to be honest, has been kind to Churchill. Uh, he was far from perfect, um, but in the, during the Blitz, uh, he was the main... He, he played such a key role in helping the Brits keep their morale high. And he spoke to the uh, British people by way of radio, not exclusively, but primarily, and he did a very good job at it. In June of 1941, Germany invades the Soviet Union, or Communist Russia. This map isn't 100% accurate, but sometimes you have to... You have to use what you can find. Uh, in 1941, Leningrad and Moscow are, are the main targets of the German military. Stalingrad um, takes place the following year. In February of 1943, the first major turning point takes place in the European theater of the war, and Stalingrad uh, results in a German loss. Okay, this is very early, 1943. Uh, the German 6th Army, roughly 300,000 Germans, are captured uh, or killed in that uh, specific battle. Perhaps you've seen the movie Enemy at the Gates with Jude Law. That's what that movie is about. Take a look at what Hitler had to say to his top officials in November of 1942. As you're reading, I'll just methodically read through here uh, with you. I do not always do things just as others want just as others uh, want them done. I uh, consider what the others probably believe and then do the opposite on principle. Okay, that tells you something about Adolf Hitler and how he approached uh, manipulating people. Another key turning point is the D-Day operation, Operation Overlord, which takes place in June of 1944. Here we have, uh, I picked this picture <clears throat> because I, it, it, it tells a lot. Uh, the spiky um, <coughs> obstacles that you see, uh, those were Czechoslovakian hedgehogs, angle iron bolted together. The purpose was to, uh, at high tide, catch the Allied landing craft and, and uh, suspend them when, uh, by luck, really, uh, when they invaded, the tide was, was down. So all those obstacles, numbering roughly one million, and there were various kinds, Belgian gates, uh, Rommel's asparagus, which was trees cut off and then sharpened at the top. Um, and so they had the uh, northern coast of France lined with roughly one million of these obstacles. And uh, in the first 24 hours, approximately 100,000 Allied troops go ashore, including, as perhaps you already know, the paratroopers who, who uh, para, uh, parachuted uh, behind German lines at night. Uh, four years ago, uh, Mark Rooney and I, I think it was four years ago, Mark, when we presented on the D-Day operation, remember the, we had the uh, gentleman from Fort Francis who parachuted into German-occupied um, France, and he, what he told Mark was um, that he could see tracers coming up in between his legs and going through the top of his parachute as he was parachuting into German-occupied France. My students can tell you what, how I feel about jumping out of a perfectly good airplane, but I can't talk like that tonight. Um, the Battle of the Bulge, another key turning point. Um, International Falls had uh, one of its own there. The Bulge, as it was called, was 80 miles roughly north to south and about 50 miles deep, taking place uh, roughly between Germany and, and France and along the Belgian border um, in parts of the Ardennes Forest. What the Allies found um, that showed, and they didn't know what was happening first, they, they, at first they found these Germans, they would capture them, and they would have hoses about the size of a, uh, you know, in, in part because uh, Cochitin County is 80% bog land, right? We have, you're all familiar with some pump hose? 
About that big round? Okay. They were finding these Germans with hoses around their necks, and they didn't know what they were for. Um, they were siphon hoses, because when they would capture an Allied vehicle, they would siphon the fuel out of it. That's how low on fuel they were. So a very last-ditch attempt, and more Americans uh, were casualties at this battle than any other part of the European theater. Not the most decorated, that's the Italian campaign, but in terms of casualties, it's the Battle of the Bulge. Um, last day of April, 1945, Hitler commits suicide. More than likely, he took a cyanide capsule as well as shot himself. Here we have uh, the Stars and Stripes in early May noting this. Um, over the years, um, I, I felt old when uh, Rachel and I did our bio information to, to uh, advertise the event. Um, this is my 26th year in higher ed, and, um, and I, I've been asked every year, uh, did Hitler escape? Um, and I'm pretty convinced based on my reading and just also knowing a little bit about megalomania, which is what he had, um, no. He didn't escape and didn't go in a submarine under the full rice cap. More than likely, 99% sure, and there were eyewitnesses, he killed himself along with his wife of one day, Eva Braun, and eyewitnesses in that bunker uh, below uh, Berlin, about 40 feet under the city, you know, were witnesses to that. I think if he had escaped, his ego would not have allowed him to not try to surface again and take over Argentina, wherever he's moving back. The formal surrender was in May, early May of 1945. Just to give you a few statistics. Is everybody hearing me okay? Is that about right? Okay. Um, numbers vary. When you study history, you can look at 10 different sources and find 10 different statistics. Uh, approximately 4 million uh, military dead and missing. Some of the Germans argue, some of the German sources argue that number is high as 8 million. About 500,000 German civilians, minimum, were killed. And during that time period, to focus on what we're taking a look at tonight, Hitler gave about 120 formal speeches um, in his political and military leadership career. We'll move to uh, looking more specifically at his speeches, his ability to speak to the German people and conquered people, and how that um, came, came about and how, how well he did it. In 1919, Hitler was employed by the German military, and he was sent to uh, Munich to watch a small political organization called the German Workers' Party. He didn't think too much of them, uh, in part because they met in a beer hall. Now, we need to keep in mind that the beer halls in, in Bavaria, in southern Germany, okay, agricultural area and parts of Austria, are not like um, those places I've heard about, uh, the, the Rainier Muni and the Border Bar and places like that. Um, they're bigger. They're much bigger. Okay, And, um, and, and one of them um, held several thousand people because they would have an outdoor court. Okay, So quite large. In 1920, he joined the German Workers' Party, and then soon thereafter, it's uh, known as the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Uh, for two main reasons, we just shortened it to Nazi, in part because of the way the German tongue the language says national, or national. And there's a, one other reason as well. Uh, the following year, he bullied his way into leading the organization. Okay? And not a gunpoint, but he, he was an all or nothing type of leader. He said, if you don't make me the leader, I'll leave and I'll bring, I'll take everybody with me who I've recruited. And they'll come with me and I'll start my own organization. A key part of his rise within that young party was his ability to speak. And he was quite a fiery. Um, this picture here, he is roughly 30 years old in this picture. Okay, he was born in April of 1889, so just add. <coughs> Take the year in the early 1900s, just add 11 to that. And that's, that's how old he is, give or take a month. Uh, in 1923, this is a picture of him. He's just out of prison, a short stint, about nine months. Uh, the Beer Hall Pooch uh, uh, in Munich. And Pooch means small revolution or a coup of sorts. And what Hitler wanted to do in 1923, he firmly believed that uh, Germany was right to be overthrown, the government was. This is also the same time when the German economy fell apart, okay? 
Uh, literally, maybe you've heard this story from your, your history classes, uh, the German people were carrying or wheelbarrowing around paper dollars to pay for one loaf of bread. The German, excuse me, the American dollar is the standard, and it took about four billion German dollars, the mark, equal one American dollar in 1923. So as the economy fell apart, his popularity went the other direction, would go up. And so um, that's something that we can uh, use as a lesson of history. Uh, uh, the, the pooch didn't work very well. Okay, about 19 or 20 people were killed, and uh, the remember that Bavaria, the southern part of Germany, was very provincial. It's kind of like uh, in Minnesota, big counties like Puchichin County, St. Louis County. That's the way Germany was divided. The country was only about um, 50 years old at that time, and so they were very district by district or provincial. And the Bavarians were you know, separate from you know, other areas of Germany, like Hesse, etc. For those of you who went to school at Rainy, how many, how many uh, graduates do we have in here? A handful? Anybody have George Stoiber for English? If you ask George where, what his nationality was, he would not say German. He was born in Germany, but he would say Bavarian. That's where he was from. Okay. Do you ever want to talk about George's... Uh, a uh, trip back to Germany after World War II to find a German bride? Just swing by my office and I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, so the, the pooch doesn't go well. Hitler, here's, here's a little window into what Hitler was like. He, before he did this, he told his men, if this doesn't work, let's kill ourselves. So he has suicidal tendencies. And when the Bavarian provincial police and then the German military fire on these revolutionaries, he is the first to leave the scene. He, he skedaddles out of there and leaves his men behind. Kind of like Napoleon. Uh, 1925, uh, he published his book, uh, Mein Kampf, which means my struggle, which he dictated to his personal secretary uh, while in prison for nine months. And Mein Kampf is pretty uh, telling. And just to... Uh, let's see. Take a look at the next slide here. What does it tell us? Well, uh, overall, big picture, it it's, uh, tells us about the future German state-sanctioned criminality of the German government, of the Nazi regime. It's sometimes called the Nazi Bible, or the Bible for National Socialism in Germany. It also tells us about his uh, political philosophy and his plans for world domination. Uh, does Mein Kampf help us better understand his approach to speaking to an audience? Let me give you this quote here from Mein Kampf. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Mein Kampf, um, it, it's about this thing. Okay? About 700 pages. It's a collection of ramblings, rants, uh, full of anti-Semitic uh, statements. But this is from Mein Kampf. Quote, He, the orator, will always let himself be borne along by the great masses in such a way that instinctively the very words come to his lips that he needs to speak to the hearts of his audience. So um, who would have thought in 1925, you know, this madman who had this funny mustache, and by the way, uh, if you're not familiar with that, he used to have a very large mustache, a little one that came down the sides of his mouth, and he wanted to be unique, distinct and stand out, so he shortened it to be just under his nose. That's why he did that. And his political cronies suggested that he do that. The older Germans laughed at him about it. Remember, most of his early recruits were young 18, 19, and 20 year olds, not older people who had survived the war. Uh, in 1925, he hires the German photographer Heinrich Hoffmann to take pictures of him. While he is speaking, he makes he is posing uh, for the camera while listening to recorded speeches of his own. And so I have three here. I'll just let you look at them. He would go back to his apartment and study them. And then he would strike these poses while making speeches for effect. 
he, he became very popular once the German economy crashed after 1925. More and more popular between 25 and 33, to the extent then that he was appointed, not elected, he was appointed the chancellor. And in Germany at that time, that was kind of like a combination of, in the United States, vice president, secretary of state, very powerful position. Okay? Or Prime Minister in Britain, a little bit like that, even though we have a king above you in Britain. On the right, we have the President, Paul von Hindenburg, who is greeting him here in January 1933. He's appointed the Chancellor. Notice how Hitler's dressed. Very business professional, very politician professional. That's before noon. <laughs> this is the same evening. He's in his paramilitary uniform, and he gives a speech which I'll, I'll play about one minute of it. Rachel will play it a little bit later. This is loud. This is loud, uh, but it's only one minute long. and uh, Hitler takes over. Basically what he does is he takes the chancellor's position and the president's position and he combines them. It's not, it wasn't quite that simple, but that's for the most part what he did. Um, so if, if uh, I've heard on a, a two major news outlets uh, when they're comparing and contrasting different politicians over time that Hitler was, was elected. Um, that's a stretch. Uh, he was appointed and then by way of maneuvering, he outlaws all other parties. You know, Saddam Hussein got 99% of the vote, too, in Iraq, you know, uh, uh, et cetera. So um, I would say he was democratically elected. <coughs> what did Hitler say in his speeches, and what were his favorite ideological concerns? What were the main ideas? Uh, before we go to the next short uh, video, I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, he was very consistent in what he said. Uh, for example, these four items were commonly in his speeches. Very anti-Semitic rants, uh, anti-Semitism, more specifically anti-Judaism, or anti-Jewish sentiment. Lebensraum, my World War II students would tell you, means living room or living space. He argued that the German people needed more space in which to colonize. Ultimately, that meant, let's invade Russia. Um, the German disintegration especially culturally and economically. And the last item, Bolshevism uh, or communism. Hitler and the Nazis were able to convince probably the majority of Germans that at the root of Bolshevism was Judaism. The Jews were responsible for communism. And one of the people he targeted was Leon Trotsky, one of the founders of the communist movement. Um, with uh, Vladimir Lenin and, and uh, Trotsky was born into a Jewish family. I'm pretty sure he was not a practicing Jew. Okay, He didn't practice Judaism. But they argued that Judaism 
led into the communist uh, movement in, in Russia. I'll bring you to the next short, uh, oh, let's see, let me back up here. Um, the, the next speech is about a, a minute and a half long. It is in the beer hall where the Munich Putsch started. I, I will um, apologize for the music that goes with it. it. It has a romantic ring to it. That's not the intent. <laughs> okay? <laughs> some of the speeches. Uh, a negative theme. We have nothing. We forgive nothing. We demand revenge. There's only defiance and hate. Hate and again hate. Uh, a positive theme. This, this grandiose visions of the future. Germany could be great again if it were united with a strong government led by a party that would have a free hand in both domestic and foreign policy. Uh, last part uh, for me is Hitler arguably was a quintessential cult of personality guy. Uh, cult of personality means when a leader uh, is campaigning and their rhetoric is about becoming the future leader of a country, it's really all about them, the individual. It's not about the country. It's not about the constitution. It's about them personally, uh, aggrandizement, uh, bolstering themselves. And the techniques that Hitler used quite effectively included mass media and propaganda by way of his propaganda minister, Dr. Joseph Goebbels. Uh, the big lie, a very common part of, of what Hitler uh, said to mass audiences. Let me give you a, a quote from his book, Mein Kampf, about the big lie. And this is in English translation. In the big lie, there is always a certain force of credibility because the broad masses of a nation are always more easily corrupted in the deeper levels of their emotional nature than consciously, 
so they move so they more readily fall victims to the big lie than the small one. Paraphrasing, he said, if you're going to tell a lie, make it a big one and tell it often. Okay? And then the spectacle. Something that mesmerizes people. And the best example of that surely is the Nuremberg rallies. Okay? Uh, they start in 1923 and they go uh, through 1938. Once the war starts in 39, they quit having them or as, not as many of them. If you take a look here, the Nuremberg rallies took place over five and six days. Now you had some repeat attenders, but in any, any given day at, at a massive rally like these, there was about 100,000 people there. Okay? So uh, the purpose, as I'm sure uh, Rachel will, will uh, found on here, was to be enticing while at the same time being deceptive and distracting and above all, superficial. Rachel? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So that's a really great way to pause this as we segue into the next. The element of superficialness is a very fascinating concept when you think of a leader that was so powerful and so influential. Let me get my notes here so I don't get off track. I want to reiterate what Joe was saying when it comes to thinking about Hitler's influence. For most of us in the United States, our education starts much sooner to World War II and the breakout than what the Germans' reality and relationship was to Hitler. We often associate 1941 as a very important date in World War II. However, when we think about the German public's um, relationship to Hitler, theirs started 20 years earlier than ours. So we need to remember and consider the fact that when we ask a question such as, how could people have believed him? We are at a very different place in time and in understanding and in context. So here's an interesting picture from Life magazine of Hitler going through the crowds. And what is the common thing that we notice when Hitler is with people or with the audience? What do you notice right away? The Hitler salute, yes. Um, this was, uh, there's an incredibly interesting book that I didn't bring my books with me today, which I'm a little sad about, but it's a book called The Hitler Salute, and it breaks down that, um, that greeting and how important and influential it was in the society um, of the time, and the fact that we don't often put much much meaning or importance on greeting other than it's an everyday thing. Well, the Hitler salute put Hitler front and center in every single relationship across the German population. Uh, it was enforced. At first it was just enforced in government meetings and government documents, and later on it was enforced for everyone to do. And Heil means hail, but also Heil means well-being, health. Interesting. Um, even potentially salvation are some of the translations of Heil. So one of the questions that came up often within the survey interviews was this question right here. How could people have believed him? Is it crackling at all, microphone-wise? Or it's pretty good? Okay. This question gives us a, an introduction into how we can study Hitler, and this question hits at what we can consider rhetoric, or the heart of rhetorical analysis. Why was Hitler so influential, and how was he so influential? And that's what I would like to go through and look at tonight. 
So first off, let's talk about what rhetoric is. We can define rhetoric as the art or skill of writing or speaking to persuade or influence some other person. When we think of rhetoric, we are all really good at this. It only takes being a child to know how to influence and persuade your parents, your siblings if you have them, into doing or believing in the same way that you do. Okay? So we all are really great at this at small scale, but Hitler was incredible at this at large scale. Um, at the heart of rhetoric is persuasion and getting things done. According to Keith and Lundberg, who in 2018 published the Essential Guide to Rhetoric, which is a small little book that's packed with incredible things, but they say persuasion is the key to coordinated action and the glue that holds people to a common purpose and collective action. So today, we're going to explore how Hitler's rhetoric did just that. Okay? Persuaded, coordinated, and collaborated into collective action. Now, rhetoric has a strong place across time and history. Uh, the origins of rhetoric, as far as our mythology goes, is in the ancient city-state of Athens, when Athens was... I feel like I'm getting kicked back, so I'll stand right here. Athens was um, developing a new form of government, democracy. Demos means the voice of the people. But to do this, they realized they need structure in place for figuring out how to talk to everyone, for figuring out how to share public voice, but also persuade people to make this government work. That's why Aristotle and Plato, philosophers, came up with structure for how we can understand technique in getting people to essentially hear us and believe us. And this is what is called argument and the rhetorical triangle. So I'm going to teach you a little bit about this rhetorical triangle. You have it in your folders too, but I want to give you this framework so that you can use this framework as I go along. Um, to analyze Hitler and his rhetoric. So here we go. The first part of this rhetorical triangle is the speaker. We often consider the speaker uh, ethos, if you've ever heard about this, credibility, belief. The speaker is the person with the knowledge. The speaker also has what we call a purpose. Without a purpose, no one is influential. Okay. We don't know what to do then. Our purpose gives us guidance into the next step of how to persuade and influence people. To Hitler, this purpose was manyfold. As Joe kind of reiterated, he had so many different agendas for um, getting Germany into glory or to kill off massive amounts of people that were communists, that were Jews, that were gypsies. Um, but truly to be in control. With the speaker and the purpose, we have our audience. Okay? The audience are the people you want to influence, the people you want to do something for, with, um, to paint that picture. The audience is what we often refer to as pathos, if you've heard that before. It's to get them emotionally invested and to move them because okay? emotion is to move as well to emote um, and it's to establish a relationship because if you have no relationship with your audience if you can't connect in words that they use you have no influence okay? it's kind of like as a kid if you didn't know your parents well how could you have succeeded in getting what you want um, message, then, is the third part of this triangle. And the message are the words or the symbols you use. We often think of this as logos, logic. Now, to Hitler, he was so charismatic that he could tell the big lie and people believed him without even backing it up. Or he would use gigantic um, embellishment and hyperbole, as we call it, to uh, create 
the feeling like he is credible and you can trust him. So we have speaker, audience, and message as part of this. And the final part of the rhetorical triangle that is incredibly important is what we call a context. So every speak, speech, everything is written, falls within a context. Tonight, our context is, oh, I feel like this is cutting out constantly. Um, tonight, our context is here in this theater, learning about a context that is removed from us. Now, we might have various connections to it in a number of numerous ways. But for our look at the context here is, what is the environment that is affecting this? What are the experiences of our audience that affects our persuasive ability? So with this rhetorical triangle, we can better see why Hitler was effective, but we also can critically analyze rhetoric that is coming towards us as audience members, or we can use this to focus and influence others with our messages. So I'm gonna break this down through Hitler's kind of history with speaker, audience, and message. So we can explore this together. So for Hitler as a speaker, let's look at this framework. Hitler is known as speaking was his talent. Okay. As Joe said earlier, in 1919 um, through 1921, Hitler rose in the ranks in the Workers' Party and became their spokesperson, but also became in charge of their propaganda. He was that good at what they did. Um, Max Domaris uh, was a German author and academic at the time of Hitler's rise, and he states in his conference, commentary on Hitler, the possibility of exercising power by means of the spoken word always held a strong fascination for Hitler. He was an extraordinary talent for public speaking, and he knew how dangerous a weapon speech could be in turbulent times. I guess I'm holding the mic in the right place now. Hitler stated in Mein Kampf, the power which has always started the great religious and political avalanches in history has been, from time immemorial, none but the magic power of the spoken word. All the great movements are national movements, volcanic eruptions of human passion and inner emotion, aroused by the cruel goddess of need, by the torch of the spoken world hurled into the masses. Pretty powerful words of how important speech was at the time. Um, this was Hitler's message. Uh, Nicholas O'Shaughnessy wrote an article in 2009 titled Selling Hitler. And it was about propaganda and the Nazi brand. And O'Shaughnessy explains Hitler's delivery um, as a speaker in this way. Hitler's speeches were a process of seduction. None but the magic power of the spoken word. The performance would rise slowly like a crescendo. The role of the visionary blended with heavy sarcasm. Inquiries about Versailles, which was the treaty of 1919, where Germany pretty much lost all their power. It was all packaged together with the delivery of a dramatic performance full of physical actions, torrents of language, symphony of gestures, repetition, and theatrical effects. Lighting, how he arrived to his speeches, um, the flags that were everywhere, you saw that picture of Nuremberg, uh, were impressive and theatrical and enormous. The way he stood on stage, um, way above everyone else, hugely powerful in presentation. Hitler was known as the professional image maker. Okay. He knew what he wanted to sell and he did it. Manipulation is probably a good word that comes to mind when you think of how he was able to influence his audience. Um, 
as a method during his speeches, he would he would drone on for sometimes an hour and a half, two hours. Thankfully, we're not doing this tonight. Uh, four hours, as Joe was saying. And he would spend the first part talking about this long mythical history of Germany and put everyone in the audience in this lethargy. We kind of just got sick of it. And in the second part of the speech, he would bombard them with incredible loud uh, speaking, increased tempos, giant gestures, higher pitching, pitch in his voice, dramatic phrases, nationalist slogans that would electrify his audience. Electrify is one of the words that has come up in various works to talk about how the crowd responded. There was a, a study in 1955 by Cox and Lazarfield, and they were the pioneers of mass communication. And in their book, Personal Influence, the part played by people in the flow of mass communication, they state that some of the most influential communication we can do is that played by those who have experienced it and share it elsewhere. We look at those Nuremberg rallies from 1923, all the way, what, what was the year? 38. Through 38. Uh, let's do the math. 100,000 people going to wherever they came from. They have a network of friends. How persuasive can you get? He knew the theatrics, the persuasion that was incredibly important. So that's a little bit about his speaking element, but let's look at audience now. Again, we see the Hitler salute. If you want to understand how a symbol or a speech or a message is persuasive, you cannot simply focus on the speaker or the message for that matter. You need to understand your audience. And that's what we call the context of audience. So let's look a little bit about, we, we heard a little bit in Joe's presentation, but I want to dive deeply into the early 20s um, after the Treaty of Versailles was signed after World War I so that you get an understanding of where the German population went and what their reality was at the time. So the Treaty of Versailles was signed in 1919. Uh, Germany was actually not in the talks. They weren't allowed in. So they were not sure what to expect. They were treated almost like prisoners when they got to the signing. And they found that Germany in this signing was had no negotiation, they had no power for it. They lost a lot of territory. They lost the ability for shipping. They, their disarmament of their ships and their military was cut to 100,000 people. So that left huge amounts of unemployment of soldiers. Um, they had to play, pay war debts because the Treaty of Versailles said that Germany was the sole responsible party in World War I. These debts originally were said to have had had Germany paid them in such a way, they would not have paid them off until 1988. Think about that. This is 1919. I was born in 1988. <laughs> so <laughs> let's think of it in that respect. Um, Overy and Wheatcraft uh, in 1989 published a book called The Road to War. And in this book, they say that the Treaty of Versailles essentially stripped Germany of its power, shattered them, and made them the pariah or the outcast of Europe. And in this time, there was a powerful sense of injustice scarred by a whole generation of Germans, a desire to reverse the Versailles Treaty and to restore German national power to return the steady on trajectory of German power lost in 1919 sank deep roots into the German society. Discontent was felt in all places. 
Now, it wasn't just the discontent of losing their power, losing their identity, but also they, as Joe pointed out, went into economic despair. <laughs> Reparations, war money, lack of plant and raw materials from lands that were taken away from them, um, lack of export markets, mass inflation, all of this kind of was like a, a stewing of all of these, these things that we don't like, okay? And we hold dear to us. Um, we can imagine the emotion that was felt and the charged atmosphere, the chaos, and Hitler's message sank in. Um, the Nazi party pledged to make things better to make things different. Uh, they spoke the language of the people. The Nazi party was well known for knowing that Germany was not one population. So you changed your message based on who you were talking to. One of the ways that they did this was through propaganda. Uh, here is a 1930s, early 1930s election poster. And it states in the top, it says, I gotta make sure I read it correctly. Our last hope and Hitler on the bottom. Economic crisis was huge and powerful. Uh, they don't look very happy here, right? So who was promising what? Um, to persuade an audience, a speaker needs to say the right thing to the right people in the right situation at the right time. I'm gonna say that one more time. To persuade an audience, a speaker needs to say the right thing to the right people in the right situation at the right time. And Hitler knew his audience. He knew what could be said. So let's move on to messages. So we're at the third point of the triangle right now of rhetoric. Messages can be spoken, they can be written, and they can also be visual. Here's the swastika, known in the Nazi party. They adopted it. The funny thing about the swastika is in Sanskrit, the swastika means conducive to well-being. The Nazi party took this and ran with it, but the meaning of the swastika throughout its time could be on race. It could be German purity, German fatherland, um, the right race, the right blood, it stood for many different symbols. That was flown everywhere. And in many different forms, in many different formats, but it became the sign. So you can't really easily remove yourself from seeing that symbol. The same way you can't remove yourself from seeing the Heil Hitler salute. Especially when the salute was enforced and if you didn't do that, you were hit, punished in many different forms. In written wise, um, in 1920-21, um, the Nazi party had their 25 point plan. And some of the main themes in this plan, and it wasn't well known at the time because uh, economic disparity wasn't bad enough until the breakdown into 1923 and then in 1929, it even harder. Um, and then the Nazi party really started picking up because when chaos reigns, Hitler did very well. Um, but some of the things that the 25 point plan had, which makes a lot of sense, was uniting all of Germany. Equal rights to German citizens more land and territory. German blood is creed and country, okay? Outsiders are aliens. Every citizen has the possibility of leaving, living decently and earning a livelihood. It's the duty of every German to work because if we work, we're not sitting around and we're contributing to the welfare of all. A stable and healthy middle class. Punishment, sometimes to the death, of those who work the injured, the common, to injure the common welfare of Germany. 
access to higher education, which the state can organize and create curriculum for, which happened, um, and even to create a strong central government. <coughs> These are important to consider. Um, visually, uh, propaganda was very important at the time, so the first task of propaganda to, was to win over people for the organization, for the Nazi organization. This first task of the organization is to gain people to continue propaganda. And the second task of propaganda was to infiltrate a new doctrine into society. Here are some examples of propaganda. This is the 1930s. Um, this was a poster that was promoting Hitler as president. He did not actually win presidency in 1930. Um, but then in 1933 was appointed chancellor. But this says, we take the fate of the nation in our hands. The next one, fascinating. This was also 1930s, Nazi propaganda. Uh, Hitler was seen as the national blacksmith, forging a new United State of Germany uh, and dissolving the other political parties. So as you can see right here, the political parties are in the forge fire. And, and you can ob obviously see the swastika. And finally, this is one of the starkest ones that I have found in propaganda posters. This says, Germany, awake. Choose life. Impressive. Powerful. What does it mean to choose life in the chaos that you find yourself in? And what does it mean to awaken? Finally, when we talk about um, speaking, we also talk about the spoken messages. And uh, Joe did a really good job of talking about the history of solidarity and some of these themes that we see coming up, the fatherland and savior complex. We see uh, and hear in his speeches a lot about um, renewal, rebirth, resurrection, and that Hitler is the one that can do this. It, it, it's a very common theme. We see threats. Uh, Hitler believed that if you had no threat, you don't have a group identity that wants cohesion. Okay. So to keep an enemy threatening the German fatherland means that you can continuously keep people in a group mentality. It's pretty impressive. Um, history is always about how Germany was downtrodden or how they were great before, so let's make them great. Um, Bramstead, in 1965's book, talks about the propaganda, says that Hitler insisted that the spoken word was more effective than the written one and had a greater, greater demagogic appeal. And a demagogue is a political leader who seeks support by appealing to popular desires and prejudices rather than rational argument or logic. Okay. So Hitler would often say that the people are so feminine in their nature and attitude that their activities and thoughts are motivated less by consideration and more by feeling and sentiment. Their sentiment is uncomplicated and simple, meaning that in Hitler's views, the masses were slow, lazy, their memories were faulty, and they reacted only to the repetition of the most simple ideas. So in all his speeches, he repeats these very simple ideas of nationality, German right, anti-Semitism, fatherland, savior, rebirth. You keep hearing those over and over and over and over again, you will believe them, especially if you want to believe them. And the German people needed change. Um, the Nazi party did really well recruiting 30-year-olds and, and, as Joe said, younger people right away. Um, and then as, as their popularity skyrocketed after 1929, they went from hundreds of thousands to millions 
in the Nazi party. Um, Hitler promised German revival, social peace. Uh, he gave expression to prejudices that people felt that were not uncommon, especially in southern Germany and Austria. Um, a desire for a strong government and social order, and he fought communism, and he wasn't tainted by the political party system. Um, Nicholas O'Shaughnessy in 2009 stated, Germans, Germany's grievances can be turned into a sense of tribal or national oppression so powerful that it bursts out into a rage of aggression against the claimed perpetrators of injustice. A sense of injustice can be talked into people, thereby leading to the rhetorical creation of conviction. Hitler offered a vision of rebirth, an enemy to hate, the righting of historical wrongs, a job, a home for the right people, bread for the table, and cash in the bank. So you tell me, why was Hitler so persuasive if we look at it from these frameworks? What I want you to do is you have on your sheet a list of th four questions. And I have about a four minute clip. Is that okay to show? Yeah. Okay. Um, that I want you to analyze Hitler's speech. Now this is the first speech that he gave after being chancellor. I have looked at so many transcription drafts of the speech and they're all different because unfortunately what we, I don't speak German, um, and translating can not always be the best, but what I have found is while this translation I am not entirely sure if it's perfect on this video, it does have all of the themes and many of the phrases that he uses across many different transcriptions of this speech. So, what I want you to do is I want you to think about speaker, audience, and message. What are you seeing delivery-wise? What are you hearing him say? And how do they connect to some of the themes tonight? I'm giving you some homework. Oh my goodness. All right. I'm going to fast forward it. Hitler had a tendency to wait and not speak for quite a long time to make his audience kind of agitated. Um, so that's part of this speech, but I'm going to start about 2.50.
Staat an den verzweifelt Hunderttausende von Existenzen ausgelöscht werden, Jahr für Jahr Zehntausende von Konkurse, Hunderttausende von Zwangsversteigerungen stattfinden und die Arbeitslöse der Wege beginnt nun zu wachsen. Eine, zwei, drei Millionen, vier Millionen, fünf Millionen, sechs Millionen, sieben Millionen. Heute möge es sieben bis acht Millionen tatsächlich sein. and then we're going to open it up to questions. We have another call gentleman over here, Shop. They have, they have the uh, cordless pipes that, that they can get. One, yes. one, two, one of the things that uh, oh, happened was that Hitler was successful at what he did. He delivered what he said he was going to do. He put people back to work. He gave them a sense of pride uh, in who they were and where they were going. Uh, he made them feel like they were extraordinary, not just average. Do you think that was part of the cult of personality? I mean, it, it was all about, the cult of personality was all about Hitler, but he also stirred strong emotions in the German people, as you saw with the, 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 the Heil Hitler salute. Um, and that was common at those massive rallies. Um, from various, I'd have to look at which books it, it, they are, but. Um, there is a lot of discussion about Hitler was a master at making fe people feel important and making people feel a shared sense of, of cohesion um, and working towards a bright and utopian future. But at the same time, Hitler would write in his documents that people were feeble-minded and that the German public were only as important as where he could get. Which is an interesting 
thoughts, and it could fall within cult of personality, is if you raise yourself up to be so high, um, what is your relationship to those who keep you there or help you stay there? There's a correlation. Uh, I taught speech for 30 years, and we used a, a uh, Dr. Alan Monroe's uh, motive, uh, Monroe's motive mm -hmm. sequence. Okay. Well, it turns out that there was a new science in in Europe in the universities, and Dr. Alan Monroe and Joseph Goebbels were in the same class of studying how to motivate people. So Adolf Hitler uh, was very successful at using the techniques that were developed, I believe, in Switzerland at, at the university. And, and I think it was in Switzerland. But the study of mo motivating people. Now, Alan Monroe, who was at Purdue University, uh, created the salesman book for every salesman to use in every store in the United States and franchises of uh, vacuum cleaners and whatever sales pitches. So there is not much difference between what Goebbels was doing with the German people and what Dr. Alan Monroe did with salesmanship for shoe stores and vacuum cleaners and washing machines in the United States. And if so, I can jump in, Rick, okay. for, for the audience who doesn't know who uh, Joseph Goebbels uh, was Dr. Joseph Goebbels. He, he, he came into the, uh, the, the clip. Uh, um, he walked with a lip. He had a foreign foot, but he was a propaganda minister. Uh, his PhD was in political science, uh, but he was, a, he was the spin doctor. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hands up. I thought I saw a hand up over. Oh, wait. Yeah. Here comes the mic. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to point out. But the Versailles Treaty, if you noticed on there, it wasn't, the United States wasn't even mentioned. It was a peace treaty between Germany, France, and Britain. And when uh, Wilson's points that he, <clears throat> that he was promoting right after the war were just overlooked, he wanted to, to help the German nation to respond to their, their economic problems, and they were very, very serious. There was a lot of, of starvation. Their food was, some of it was there, but they couldn't buy it because their money was worth so little. My grandfather was a banker back in the uh, early parts of the uh, last century. And he, he had cousins over in, in Berlin, and he sent the money. Uh, you know, it was just, they just, and when Hitler came along, his, his, he was so exciting. He got those people all riled up, and it didn't take very much, because they were suffering. And the money was, you know, concentrated in the Jewish people. That was one big mistake that Hitler made was his annihilation, their attempted annihilation of the Jews. They had money. I'll jump in. They kept it. You know, they didn't, yeah. they did, didn't get out of the circulation. Well, well the, the so Jews did have money. Was, it was a really very, very difficult situation. But, but Hitler, if you notice, he, he shouted a lot. Yeah. And he was very excited. If you notice with the, the old uh, microphones they have there, the old crystal microphones, they were very uh, ineffective. And, but he had, a, he had a, quite a, a sharp voice, and, and the people could hear him. And it didn't matter what he said. They would, they would shout him, oh, I don't, I don't. anyway. And not, some of the people couldn't even understand him, because they didn't, they, he, he spoke high German. And some of the people, like from where I am, up in the North, North Sea area, they spoke Flutterage, low German. They couldn't even understand. My grandmother was Flutterage, and my grandfather spoke high German. They didn't converse at home. But, you know, uh, it didn't matter what he said. It was his action and his, his forcefulness that, that really turned everybody 
to his way of thinking. And of course, the young people really respond. And not to stray from the, the whole the focus of speeches, but something I mentioned to Rachel probably yesterday when I was at the peak of my anxiety over today. Uh, today was much better. Uh, um, the, the, the German business community benefited from the high inflation, the, the rampant runaway inflation. They benefited because they paid off their debts. The German people themselves suffered. Um, I don't know proportionally how much wealth the Jewish community had, um, uh, but we, we, know we need to be careful with that, you know, and, and I'm not saying that you wouldn't be careful with that. Uh, but one of the things that he capitalized on was describing Jews as the shyster lawyer, the, uh, the jeweler, the doctor, and, and we, we tend to associate those professions with extreme wealth, or at least, you know, sizable amount more than, you know, uh, the teacher's pay. Uh, <laughs> I threw that up there. See if you're awake yet. Uh, but, uh, uh, but you know, they, they, they exploit to that extensively. But uh, a quick example, a New, York, uh, Time, a New York Times reporter went to one of the Nuremberg rallies. He was not a Nazi. He wasn't a fan of all that. But uh, I watched an interview, and this was in the mid-30s, and he, he said he had to put his hands in his pockets so he wouldn't do the Heil Hitler salute. That's how powerful these rallies were with 100 to 150,000 people every single day with the constant messaging that Hitler and the Nazis put out. He wasn't a fan of the Nazi party, but it was very, uh, it just didn't uh, We often refer to this phenomena in communication as emotional contagion. And emotional contagion is you feel like you need to react in the same way or the same emotional vibe that those who are around you are acting. So this goes in place of if you're your uh, economy and your population, or those who you are around, feel incredibly depressed, that will depress emotionally many in that group. And the same is, in rallies such as these, you cannot help but react to the incredible excitement that are, as a, anybody went to a concert, high energy, you feel like you too need to embrace it in some way? Well, that is what happens, and it's completely a natural phenomenon. Um, it's the same way if you're fighting with your partner or your family member, and one of you is really angry, and the other's blood pressure rises. Emotional contagion. I'm Bohemian, so I don't have that oh. blood pressure issue. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, wait, there's one gentleman there. Uh, Hitler's niece, Gelly, shot herself about 1931-32, and she was pregnant. And Hitler blamed that on a Jewish man, even though I don't think there's any ever proof for it, but it just added to this scenario of making Jews responsible for all these things that might have happened. I mean, and Germany wasn't exclusive in this because around the death scenario, about 1890, Jews were driven off their property, uh, they lost everything, they came to America or Great Britain, wherever they could go. But you don't see this in the speeches, but yet uh, people in Germany must have been extremely prejudiced and racist against the Jews and the gays and the uh, even the gypsies because that's where most of the people in the death camps ended up uh, were from those groups of people. And so uh, there, there was an underlying rallying point among these people, and that was hugely anti-Semitism. And anyone that has any Jewish connections is always very concerned, even when young students today start becoming anti-Semitic. It's a, it's a terrible uh, uh, sign. I mean, I believe that uh, uh, we have to always be concerned when there's an underlying blame of a certain group of people for things that aren't good. And uh, of course, that was occurring. That from from World War One to World War Two, and that's where the Jewish people had to suffer so horribly. You bring up a great point or question in the fact of um, one of the the conversational pieces when we ask how could people would believe him or follow him. Um, to what extent are we willing to look the other way? on some of what the Nazi party, or the audience at the time, the Nazi party was saying in order to achieve other parts of what the Nazi party was promising you. And that, that is found within the literature of um, the Nazi party knew their audiences, 
Um, and to those who were more anti-Semitic populations, they had a lot more propaganda based on anti-Semitism. To those populations in the German lands um, who that wasn't as encultured there, they did less propaganda in that sense. Now, obviously, with large speeches, uh, they came out in various speeches, but we also have to realize that targeted propaganda was a thing, and still is. Uh, so who heard which messages the most really changed across the state, across the country? And um, it is begging the question of, in a desperate, chaotic um, society that longs for some hope, what are you willing to turn your eyes away from for hopefully a chance of better? Good question. I'll, I'll just make two, two uh, basic comments. Uh, as, you, as you alluded to, anti-Semitism was rampant throughout Europe. It was well, it was widespread. Um, a second part uh, uh, I would recommend for especially the serious reader, uh, and, and the not so serious, uh, Daniel Goldhagen's book, Hitler's Willing Executioners. In that, it's a PhD dissertation out of Harvard. Uh, he argued that the version of anti-Semitism in Germany was unique and more powerful than any other place uh, in Europe. And uh, for those who are familiar with the Milgram study, authority figures, or the Ash study, uh, conformity, uh, he, he shreds them and says, neither one explains the Holocaust in Germany. And when the average German was told to pull the trigger, they said, okay. Now, having said that, one of the reasons why I don't want to do a lot of research in my background, <laughs> because my grandmother's hometown uh, was near Lith Lithuania, the Polish-Lithuanian border, Roman Catholics in Lithuania, keep in mind I grew up Roman Catholic, so I'm not trying to slight anybody who practices that faith. Um, Roman Catholics in Lithuania slaughtered Jews. And, and you know, there's one scene where they, they beat up a whole bunch of people with crowbars and baseball bats and slaughtered them. And then somebody said, who's the guy playing the accordion on top of the pile? And they said, well, that's the mayor. And those folks weren't German, they were Lithuanian. So they got challenges in various places. Yes. Um, why was German money so much like cheaper than American? You're gonna. <laughs> so usually this is why I have a co-presenter is when I don't know the answer, <laughs> then uh, then I refer to that person. Um, I, I don't know the answer for sure, uh, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, a currency, uh, basic faith in the economy, loosely put, is much more important important than we think. I mean, it's, it's almost as simple as that at times. Keep in mind, I'm not an economist, okay? But uh, I can tell you with the runaway inflation where it went from uh, tens of thousands of ger German marks or dollars to over the billion dollar mark, it just it just destroyed their economy. Okay? So maybe if you want to put down your, your contact information, I can try to find out for you and get back to you. Uh, on the Treaty of Versailles reparations issue, there's all sorts of sides to that. You know, if you want to think revenge, did the Germans do any, I'm not, I'm not trying to stir the pot here necessarily, but to get you to think, did the German, not that you're not doing that already, but the, the, the Germans um, made the Russians pay when they got into World War I, they socked it to them economically. Some studies suggest they could have paid it all back. I think the whole point is they didn't want to because it damaged them, so it, 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 it cut right through them and then being told you have to take the whole blame for the war. I mean, my wife was here, somewhere else, um, <laughs> there, will tell you that, that they still here. She's a oh, Okay, and, uh, and I, I love money, and uh, I'm very tight with my money, so if you want to hurt me, you just take my money. And so, uh, <laughs> so but uh, put down your contact information and we'll see what we can find for you, okay? The one, the one thing that I, that I noted that, that when Adolf Hitler came to power, uh, the, the infrastructure of the country uh, started, uh, the Audubon was, was built. And, and this was a pre-war, but people were getting paid a reasonable salary by the German government. Where did all that money come from? They were printing it, I mean, yeah. I mean, a large sums. 
uh, when, when the, the enormous Nazi-backed state projects started to kick in, their deficit skyrocketed. And the thing that changed that, at least for a while, was when the war started, and perhaps some of you know this, the, I'm not sure it was formal, but it was well agreed upon that the, the way to pay for things was to loot, plunder, which included the Jewish communities that had wealth. And, and that was a, a target. The banks. The banks. The German government took the money from the banks. Uh, uh, no, private, excuse me, uh, private citizens. Oh, right. Yeah, the, 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 the looting and plundering of, of, the, of the greater German, the greater right when they conquered America. Yeah, sorry. Over here, I think. Uh, can you pass out this? In the early years, when Hindenburg died, was there any suspicion about his death? Oh, my dear. No, he was well. He was well into his 80s already. Yeah, with a big step up for Hitler. Um, um. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. And his, uh, for the last couple of years, uh, some authors over the years, I've read words like senility, things like that. He was uh, showing his age, but he was a World War I hero. And, and Hitler made sure that he uh, pretty much uh, paid the equivalent of homage to him, as we saw him pretty much bowing before him uh, that morning that he was appointed chancellor. Uh, he knew he, he, he disused his time. He knew Hindenburg could not last forever. And there were many steps about, well, it wasn't it that same year that the SA and the SS fairly split, and there was a, was it wrong? Yeah, the, the, the brown shirts, uh, the, the muscle, the thugs. Um, Hitler needed to kind of ratchet up his professional aspects of, of who he was, the Nazi party was, so they gutted the, purged the, the muscle. By purge the yeah. 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 yeah, they, 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 they rounded them up and uh, got rid of that. And that was one of the agreements. And so, uh, not that the SA disappeared, but the SS, the Schutzstaffel, became which linked, which linked Hitler significantly with the German military at the time. Yes, he um, did. Yep. Which provided these really key steps into when Hindenburg died, there were really, there was no one really to call him out on proclaiming himself the Fuhrer. He, need, he needed the backing of the army, without a doubt. He, he knew he needed that and he cut some deals. He was a deal cutter at times, um, but oftentimes he, he was better at forcing somebody, usually by gunpoint, at making a deal than receiving one. And also, uh, the concentration camp started uh, fairly soon after Hitler became appointed chancellor. So uh, that was the start of a lot of political criminals, yep. and uh, then ramped up when uh, Himmler was allowed to concentrate uh, all that power. So before Hitler was appointed into government, there really wasn't a system of concentration camps. So the German people weren't necessarily expecting that. And Dachau was the first one for political dissidents, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Yeah. I went in the military during the Korean War, and we trained in California for Korea, and we had three days to get from our base uh, to the ship and ship out to Korea, but instead, I got my orders, half of us went to Korea, the other half went to Germany. Uh, so I spent uh, 53 and 54 in Germany, and uh, we were on maneuvers, uh, war games, uh, every six months out of the year, and we were occupation forces there for uh, uh, to fight, fight the Russians, it was the Cold War. And uh, we were preparing for uh, fighting the Russians, and it was uh, almost every time we went on uh, on maneuvers, it was retreat to the Rhine because we were outnumbered, well, at least eight to one. Uh, 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 Russians outnumbered us. But uh, at that time, uh, as for what I could see, the, the German people, uh, no, uh, the uh, all thought Hitler was wonderful. You know. Even at that time. And they, they wouldn't believe that, they couldn't hardly believe that what happened to the Jewish people happened, and they would. They would never admit that they knew anything about it. And uh, the, the black market, 53 and 54, was really big. And uh, there was a lot of uh, military people in the black market. 
and uh, you could pay a dollar a, a ten for a carton of cigarettes and sell it for twenty marks, five dollars or more. And uh, it, it was good duty over there. We had the finest of living quarters, and the food was very good. And uh, so it, uh, I, I never forget my time over there. I toured many other countries of so, well being over there. You know, and just piggybacking on that a little bit, one of the questions we need to think about, and one of the miracles, for lack of a better way of putting it, and we can apply this to Japan as well after the war, is Germany rebounds economically quite, at least Western Germany, uh, Western Germany, quite quickly. And, and today, Germany, um, roughly 60% of its economy is industrial. Uh, some of the things we've been talking about. We are very skilled people and very hardworking people. Uh, young people, they, they go to trade schools and different things, and uh, whether it's quick players or welders or whatever, they're, they're highly trained people, it appeared to me. Thank you. Uh, Bill? What was, what was Hitler's economic message in all those speeches? How was he going to get them out of that funk economically, other than the war machine? Uh, massive state support. Plain simple. Uh, German government support uh, for uh, however, whatever word you want to use, subsidized. Uh, it, it was uh, Germany's, uh, prior to the start of the war, Germany's uh, debt increased dramatically. And he was, uh, in many ways, copying the model uh, given to, to him, to Europe, by Mussolini in Italy. Uh, Mussolini was a dictator of Italy roughly 10 years before Hitler. Hitler admired him, and, and uh, you know, one of the sayings is, well, Mussolini kept the trains, you know, going on time. And it built, an, it built an infrastructure in and around that, uh, but uh, the debt increased. Did I say one more thing? Well, why don't we go, we'll give this person back here, uh, if you don't mind, uh, uh, quick question. Uh, one of the, the things I observed from those tapes was he was almost like a really good preacher. He had a cadence and a rhythm and a hypnotic quality. And he started low and built. And he used, yet his speeches were, everything's bad, it's falling apart. Uh, we've been such victims, and then he went into the blame thing of the blame is everybody that isn't Aryan. Er, er, I would say that it's all those other people, so we've got to get rid of them and kill them and lock them up and that kind of stuff. And and then he built this emotional thing, and he went from with the, the blaming something else to I will fix it. I will fix it and and take care of you. And then him at the audience yelled and they mirrored each other's behavior. He held up his arms, they held up their arms. So there was this emotional, neurological bonding. So anyway, that's just some observations to think about. Yeah, I would say call the personality of any ways, aspects of that. Uh, grandiose gestures, grandiose promises. And those themes were repeated, and they became part of the rhetoric uh, that they shared. I mean, the rhetoric is the reality between the audience and the speaker and the message. So it's, it shows how powerful persuasion in that sense was for the Third Reich. Uh, we'll probably hang around here for a little while. I mean, if history serves, we'll, we'll, we won't get out of here real quick. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, tell, I tell my students the, the mind can only take in what the butt can endure. And so uh, we've been here, you know, eight years at 6.30, and I realize, you know, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, we can field some more questions. Uh, if you want to give us your feedback uh, or contact information, if you have a question, just bring it up and give it to us. We uh, thank you for your, for your participation, your attendance tonight.